In the previous video, we learned how to find a basis for the column space of a matrix. Uh, now in this video, I wanna talk about finding a basis for the null space of a matrix. This one's a little bit more involved. Remember that the null space of a matrix A, this is going to be the solution set, the solution set of the homogeneous system AX equals zero. And so we have to basically solve the problem, solve the homogeneous system in order to find the solution set. And then when we do that, it turns out in the process of solving for the solution set, we can actually pull out a basis. We've been doing it already. We just didn't know it. Let's explain why it works. Now, one thing to remember is that if two matrices are row equivalent, what does that mean? It means that you can transform one matrix into the other by some sequence of row operations, replacement, interchange, or scaling. And if you have a system of equations, like AX equals zero, replacing a matrix with a row equivalent matrix doesn't change the solution set whatsoever. And as a consequence, if, if, if row equivalency doesn't change the solution set to a linear system of equations, and the null space is a solution set to the homogeneous system, that means if A and B are row equivalent, then the two, matrix, uh, the two matrices will have the same null space. The null space of A is equal to the null space of B. This is particularly useful if B, for example, is the RREF, of the original matrix A. So our strategy, our strategy for finding a basis for the null space is gonna be the following. We're gonna use the same technique we've done before to solve the homogeneous system, like we did, for example, in section 2.6. Um, and then we're gonna focus on the non-pivot columns of the matrix. Uh, these non-pivot columns are gonna to correspond to the free variables, and the free variables are the, are the things that are gonna produce non-trivial solutions to the homogeneous system. So that's how we're gonna proceed. And I'm gonna use an example to explain what's going on here. Consider the following three by five matrix A. We're gonna construct a basis for the null space of this thing. Now, if you're paying attention, this matrix might seem familiar. Turns out we played with this exact matrix in the previous video of this series. Uh, so we showed that if you take this matrix A and you perform some raw operations, you can get the following echelon form of the matrix. Now that matrix is not yet in row reduced echelon form to solve the null for the for the null space here. Although you can get away with it in echelon form, you probably want row reduced. And so let's do one more step uh, to get rid of the three right here. We're just gonna take row one minus three times row two, and we get the following matrix right here. So this matrix right here is the RREF of A. Now, it, we are solving a homogeneous system, so be aware that I did augment the column zero here. But the fact that you have a column of zeros means that when you do row operations, nothing will ever change. So when we did, when we found the basis for the column space, I didn't put this, this column of zeros on here. That was okay. I don't need to do that because I'm doing the same row operations, but they don't affect this zero column. So therefore, I can slap it on without any big deal whatsoever. The reason I'm including it this time is to emphasize that this augmented matrix represents a system of equations. So when we take the RREF form of this augmented matrix, the first row will give us x1 plus 3x3 plus 5x4 plus x5 equals 0. The second, the second row gives us the equation x2 uh, minus, four, minus x4 plus x5 equals 0. Now the third row actually is just the equation zero equals zero, which is offering no benefit to the system whatsoever. So I omitted it here. Now, because these, you know, looking at these, uh, these equations here, we see that because of the pivots, these are gonna be dependent variables. And so like we saw before, the first and second columns of A give us a column space for the, they give us a, a basis for the column space. But for the null space, we're gonna focus now on the non-pivot columns because these are what's gonna give us the free variables. The solution to a homogeneous system, its size is dependent on how many free variables you have here. That's why the nullity is going to be three here. We're counting the free variables. And so if we solve the dependent variables with respect to the free variables, we get that x1 equals negative 3x3 minus 5x4 minus x5. Notice that the coefficients of x3, x4, x5 change their signs as they move to the other side of the equation. And then we also see that x2 is gonna equal x4 minus x5. So again, the coefficients of x4 and x5 changed from positive, negative, or vice versa when we move to the other side of the equation. 
That's an important detail that will be helpful in a little bit. Just kind of notice that. So we solved this system. We have these free variables in play here. So if we look at the general solution to this homogeneous system, this is the vector x, which has five variables, five components, x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5. Now, what we've learned here is the following. Well, x3 is a free variable, so it can be whatever it wants. Uh, and, you know, same thing with x4 and x5. You know, they're just like queen, whatever I want to be. Uh, x1 and x2, on the other hand, they're dependent variables. And so we have to use these assignments from above. x1 will be negative 3x3 minus 5x4 minus x5. And x2 is given as x4 minus x5. So this is the general solution. But this general solution, I could decompose it into smaller vectors. That is, I could, I could kind of rip it apart into the three vectors correspondent to the free the three free variables that sounds like a dr seuss thing right there free three i can't even say it three free variables i need to go read fox and socks tonight i think to my kids to practice this for the next lecture so if you take the first take the first vector associated to x3 so look at those terms in this vector that involve an x3 like so so we get the vector negative three x3 zero the second one didn't have any x3s in it we had an x3 and then the last two didn't have any x3s in it uh the next one it, we're gonna have a vector for x4 which there are a few of those inside the vector right here so the next one would look like negative 5 x4 x4 0 x4 and 0. and then lastly we're gonna do a third vector for x5 we're gonna do this for each of the free variables x5, 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 like so. So make sure you grab all of those. This is going to give us negative x5, negative x5, 0, 0, and x5. So we separate, we separate our general solution into a sum of three vectors dependent on the, th the three free variables. Oh, see, I practiced that one. And so for each of the free variable vectors, factor out one factor out the free variable. So for the first one, you can take on an x3, and this gives us negative 3, 0, 1, 0, 0, like so. For the next one, you're going to take out the x4, and that leaves behind a negative 5, a 1, a 0, a 1, and a 0. And then for the last one, take out the x5, and that gives you negative 1, negative 1, 0, 0, and 1. And so for clarification, well, maybe just simplification, let's call this first one U, this second one V, and this third one W. I think that's the alphabet. And so what we have now see is that this right here, we're saying that X is just the combination X3 times U plus X4 times V plus X5 times W. And since X3, 4, and 5 are free variables, we can choose them whatever we want, X will be a linear combination of these three variables right here. And as X was the general solution, this then gives us that the null space of A is equal to the span of these three variables, U, V, and W. And that agrees with what we said earlier. The nullity of the matrix is how many, how many free variables are in the system. We counted there was three, and therefore, it should be span, we should be able to span it using three independent variables, in three independent vectors, I should say. And we have, in fact, our three vectors. But how do we know they're independent? Look at these three vectors, and I'm gonna make the following kind of argument. If we look at just look at just the third position right here, you'll notice that every other vector has a zero there. And so if this thing is gonna to combine to be give me an x3 somehow, I basically got to force x3 to be this coefficient because no one else is going to contribute to the third component. So there's no way that this thing could add up to be zero without this coefficient being zero. Not going to happen. And same thing for the other ones, right? If we focus on the fourth entry, notice here that in the fourth component, um, v has a one, u and w have a zero. If this were to add up to be the zero vector, it would basically force that this coefficient would have to be zero. And again, same thing for the fifth component as well. The fifth one, w, so that is, I should, the, fourth, the fifth component of w has a one for u and v, they're both zero. The only way you could get a zero in the last component is if we had a coefficient right here. So these vectors are independent. Basically, if you kind of forgot 
we put this together as a matrix and you kind of forgot the first two rows, this would be a matrix in row reduce echelon form. That's going to be independent. So we do have, in fact, we do in fact have an independent set of vectors which span the null space. So this right here gives us a basis for the null space. And that's really great. And this is this is actually the technique we saw before, right? So in the process of trying to solve uh, homogeneous systems, we actually were finding bases for the null space. But it turns out we can dramatically simplify this process. How are we gonna do that? Well, I'm gonna come back up to the original matrix right here. Uh, now, one thing I should mention in contrast with the column space, the column space, the, the basis will consist of vectors from the original columns of A. When it comes to the basis for the null space, these vectors do not coincide with columns or rows of A. They do not coincide with rows or columns of the R or EF either. Um, they, they, they come about from solving the system of equations. But what I want to mention to you is that this process of finding the RREF, pulling out a general solution, ripping it apart, this process can be dramatically simplified in the following manner. So when you have your RREF and you want to find the null space here, what you need to do is you need to identify who are the free variables which we saw before. And you're going to create a vector for each of the free variables. So there is a, there is a vector that's going to be associated to X3. So what you're going to do is that you're going to just put a little asterisk right here in those positions that are corresponding to pivot positions. And then for the free variables, you're either going to put a 1 or a 0, depending upon are we on x3. You put a 1 in the 3 spot, you put 0 and 4 and 5. Then there's going to be a free, the free variable x4 will produce a vector that gives us the basis. You're going to put a star, a star where the dependent variables go. You're going to put a 1 in the fourth position and then 0 in the other free spots. And then lastly, there should be a vector associated to x5. You're going to put a 1 in, it, in the fifth position, 0 in the indices that correspond to the other free variables, and then put asterisk, just these little stars, in, where the, in the 1 and 2 spot. The reason we put stars for 1 and 2 is that for 1 and 2, those were the dependent variables, so it depends on which of these variables we're looking at. So you start off with these 1s and zeros. Okay. Now what you're going to do is you're going to fill in these stars. So let's look at the first row here. These stars are going to coincide by looking at the first pivot row. So we know that x1 is a dependent variable because there's a, there's a pivot position in the first column. But then associated to that first column, there's a pivot row. We're gonna read off the numbers in this pivot row uh, corresponding to it. So if we look at the first row, notice in the three spot, you have a three. And so I'm gonna record a negative three right here. In the fourth column, we have a five. I'm going to write a negative five right here. And then here in the fifth column, we have a we have a one. I'm going to write a negative one right here. So we're going to write down the numbers we see in this first column, in this first row, excuse me, based upon which variable is it connected to. Now you might wonder why did you do a negative three as opposed to a positive three? Remember what I mentioned earlier? That when you move the when you move the three x three to the other side of the equation becomes negative. That is what we're incorporating right here. So as you go from the matrix to the vector, it's like you're moving the variable to the other side of the equation. It switches its signs. How about x two? How about x two here? So you look at the second row. You can ignore the pivot columns, but we look at the second pivot row. So in the three spot, you get a zero. So we get negative zero, which is still zero. In the fourth spot, we have a negative one, so I'm going to record a one. And then in the fifth spot, we have a one, so I'm going to record a negative one. And so there, this right here will be our basis for the null space of the matrix. And hopefully these vectors look a little bit familiar, right? So the first one was negative three, zero, one, zero. I wonder if I can get them all on one slide here. I'll have to zoom out a little bit. Uh, you can then compare, right? Negative three zero one zero zero. That was the same thing. The next one was negative five one zero one zero. Same thing. And the last one's negative one negative one zero zero one. Same thing. So we can actually extract extrapolate these uh, the basis of the null space directly from the RREF, and we can kind of skip all of this middle stuff with systems of equations, general solutions, if we want to. Now, if this if this more long out, drawn out process makes sense to you, that's fine, but I did wanna show you this nice little shortcut. And in the next video, I'll, I'll do another example of the shortcut method for finding the null space of a matrix.